This week in digital photography, we'll be opening the door to portrait photography. In this video, we'll be taking a look at some basic principles of portrait work, including building rapport with your subject, locations for portraits, a few basics of posing, and finding the perfect lens for portrait work. We all know what portrait photography is, right? It's pictures of people, but there are lots of different types of portraits, and they can vary greatly. But really good portrait photography goes beyond simply pointing a camera at someone and pushing the shutter button. Portrait photography is the art of capturing the inherent character of your subject within your photograph. It is a combination of the right technique and the photographer's artistic expression. Portrait photography is one of the most readily accessible revenue generating forms of photography largely because portraits are generally agreed upon between the subject and the photographer, and so there's an innate buyer in every photo session. Some forms, like wedding photography, can have a lot of potential buyers, as there are many people involved and everyone is generally looking their best on the big day. Of course, weddings are also some of the most complex and demanding photographic situations you can encounter. Shooting weddings is not something the general amateur should dive into, but there are lots of beginners out there shooting fashion, glamour, candids, concept art, family and newborn, and more. If you're a people person and have a basic understanding of your camera, there's a good chance that you can find a fit for yourself in portraiture. Portrait work, unlike any other genre of photography, requires a certain level of rapport between the photographer and the subject. If your subject is uncomfortable, it's going to show in every photo that you take. It's important that you, as the photographer, is confident in your own technical skills so that your subject can feel at ease in front of your lens. If you're out there fumbling with your settings, awkwardly fiddling with lights, the subject is going to question whether or not you're going to be able to take the quality images they want. Remember that most people feel a little uncomfortable having their photos taken. Some people downright hate it. So simply sitting down and allowing you to take their photo can be stressful for many people. You want to do everything you can to assure your subject that you know what you're doing and that you're going to deliver great images that will make them look good, whatever that might mean to them. Location is an important consideration when shooting portraits. Many people prefer being photographed outdoors because they're more comfortable being outdoors rather than in a big studio with all the lights and all sorts of camera gear. Shooting outdoors also lets your subject interact with their environment, which can help with the ever-present question of just what to do with my hands. For some portraits, it may make more sense to shoot on location. These portraits, typically referred to as environmental portraits, rely on a photographing a subject within a very specific environment. For example, this potter at Genesee Country Village and Museum photographed in her workshop. Other examples might be a preacher photographed in a church, maybe a chef photographed in a kitchen, or a famous author in their study. In these situations, the location is a critical part of the story that's being told in the portrait. In environmental portraits, we generally want to include a significant portion of the background in sharp focus, rather than filling the frame with the subject. And so we often shoot with a wider depth of field, a smaller aperture, like maybe an F16 or an F22. And finally, studio portraits give us the most creative control as we can set lights, choose backdrops, props, wardrobe, all while minimizing distractions. Studio photography is, in many ways, a lot like a human still life. Studio photography also benefits from being indoors, so the weather is never a factor. Posing for portrait photography is an art form all of its own. I'll be including several video links for YouTube tutorials related to posing, but posing can be broken down into some general categories that you should be aware of. Typically, we build poses based on the type of portraits we're creating. Are we shooting full length, three quarter length, head and shoulder shots, or a tight head shot? Those are the most common crops that we use in portrait photography. A few basic tips for posing portraits. Typically, having a subject facing you with their shoulders square to the camera is going to make the subject appear broader than they are, which is fine if you're photographing a high school football player and posing them to look strong and menacing. But most people prefer to be slimmed down in their photos. So we often want to pose the subject with their shoulders turned about 45 degrees away from the camera. When posing a female subject, we usually want to create or emphasize her curves 
establishing a sense of grace and femininity. The S-curve pose builds on that concept, simply using the line of her arms, back, hips, and legs to create those curves. Another one that's designed to help a subject appear thinner is to simply create a light trap or a space between their body and their arms. If we keep their arms tight against the torso, their midsection takes on the visual weight that includes their forearms. If we create a space between the arms and the body, we allow the viewer to see the natural line of the body and separate the weight of the arms away from the body. This, combined with other slimming techniques like the S-curve, and we exaggerate the curve, making the subject look even thinner. Portraits don't always have to be happy, smiley images. While it's common for weddings, high school seniors, and candidates, other forms of portraits often do better with more serious or emotional expression. Play around with the expression, depending on the theme of the image that you're going for. The black and white image on the left has a pensive, almost lost in space sort of feel. The wedding image of a couple of good friends of mine has actually scored several more weddings for me just because it always makes people laugh when they see it. The image of the broken mirror has a piercing gaze, while the ghost in the window has a haunting feel. The image in blue on the far left was a concept shoot illustrating depression. We gave her a somber expression and then changed the white balance in camera to give it a dark blue cast. I added the raindrops in post-processing as it felt like rainy days were somewhat iconic of depression. On the flip side, Erin couldn't keep a straight face for the life of her, and we got lots of great images of her goofy personality. The firefighter image is actually a 17-year-old trainee, and while we can't see her face at all, we can definitely feel a badass mood here. The most important part of nearly any portrait is going to be the eyes. Setting a wide aperture with a low f-stop, like an f1.8 or an f2, can give you a very narrow depth of field. This allows you to get sharp focus on the eye and then let the background disappear into a nice soft blur known as bokeh. This is especially great for minimizing distractions from background elements that might otherwise compete for the viewer's attention. In addition to the low f-stop number, using a longer lens can also help to provide you a shallow depth of field. As we know from earlier in the course, longer lenses give us the shallower depth of field. The most common lenses for portraiture range from 85 to 150 millimeters on a full frame camera. These lenses strike a good balance, not too long and not too short. Wider lenses, those that are less than 85 millimeters on a full frame camera or 50 millimeters on a crop sensor camera are more prone to distortion. The issue isn't so much the lens as it is the likelihood of being too close to your subject. When you're really super close to your subject, their nose is going to appear disproportionately large because it is significantly closer to the camera than the rest of the person. And we know that whatever is closest to the camera will appear larger. If you're shooting an environmental portrait, including the scene behind the subject, you will likely be far enough away from the subject that distortion won't be an issue. If we get shallower depth of field with a longer focal length, why not just shoot every portrait with the 500 millimeter lens? Well, a couple of reasons. For starters, using a massive lens like a 500 millimeter will be overwhelmingly heavy and you would need to shoot everything on a tripod. Additionally, if you're using a lens like that, you'd need to be standing over 30 feet or more away and that distance makes it hard to maintain a rapport with your subject. And finally, a 500 millimeter lens is likely to be cost prohibitive for most photographers. A good quality 500 millimeter lens can easily set you back $3,500 to $7,000. Up next, we'll take a deep dive into studio lighting, including basic equipment, as well as some of the tried and true lighting patterns that are often used in commercial portrait work.